Lord, we thank you for this time together. We ask for your guidance and uh, move us and guide us into all truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this we're completing this little mini-series on science, faith, and reason, and I have a lot of these mini-series. I must have a couple hundred of them. Uh, on, on, on all kinds of different topics, because um, we I'm interested in everything. But um, I'm, I thought it would be very helpful for us to do things that help us with the life of the mind, because you see, uh, we're dealing with something that is reasonable. It's a reasonable faith, you see. And so um, if anything, then, it, in a world, a, a level playing field of ideas, this is the best available. It really is. So it is something that satisfies the mind. And it is, but it, at the same time, it satisfies the heart. And so it really comports with all these things because God's made us as rational beings. He's made us as be people who want relationships, and, but we also have to embed those in truth. And his word is truth. So the four features of the world we were describing is, first of all, the evidence for the universe is beginning. And we saw that contrary to the desire of the majority view, where they hoped that the universe was just eternally existing. That was the whole steady state theory. It turned out that the evidence now points to the beginning, a beginning event of uh, where you go backwards in time. And it turns out that it, you can see that there is a beginning event, that time was not eternal, and that time and matter and space and energy, uh, have, there was a beginning event that suggests very much what we see in Genesis 1. And we also then saw, as well, evidence for the fine-tuning of the cosmos. We're living in a Goldilocks universe. It's so exquisitely complex and finely tuned, in fact, that uh, one uh, begins to suspect that we won the cosmic lottery and that it was uh, d designed for us. And there are people trying to get away or work their way around that. And we'll, uh, actually, they postulated the whole idea as a workaround, a whole idea of a multiverse where perhaps, oh, if we have an infinite number of universes, then maybe we're the ones who just happen to be here having this conversation. But that doesn't work for a lot of reasons. And one of those many reasons, uh, because you see there's uh, the, the, the very factor, the, the very fact is, uh, if you're appealing to something from, from that, uh, you also have the idea, it's, it's much simpler to say, instead of having an infinite number of universes, just to have to have one creator, one mind, one maker, and it makes it simpler. Besides which, even if you had an infinite number of universes, you don't solve your problem. Because it turns out to have a universe, you'd have to have a universe generating mechanism that's finely tuned, and that's as finely tuned as the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, you have to work that one through. So you're right back to where you began. Just as the whole di idea of the origin of life turns out to be problematic, as we'll see, because it leads to the problem of where did it come from? So the solution they have is maybe it came from outer space, but that doesn't solve the problem either. So we see then inference to the best explanation is always the best approach to take. And that's where we have been, and that's where we go. So that when we're looking at something like the Mount Rushmore, we certainly see that the natural causes um, are evident that uh, would account. Erosion and other features uh, would account for the f structures of, the wor of, of that mountain. But when we're looking at the faces of these presidents, you begin to get very suspicious that there was some de designing agency, and we actually know who the designer was, Guts and Ber Berglum. And so we look at certain features, and that's why we have the turtle and the fence post and things of this sort, and we know that there are certain ways of reasoning that point beyond that, and we understand that's how it works. And so that's where we look at these things and make certain conclusions that are consistent. Biogenesis is the third feature of the world, and I'll just say a few words about this. Um, this is what we were looking at before, but I just kind of synthesize our basic thoughts and then move on to information theory. Biogenesis has to do with the origin of the first living cell, and there is no simple cell. Whether plant or animal, all cells are exquisitely complex, and the more we look at them, the more astonishing they become. The more information we have, the more uh, evidence we behold, the more elegant they become, not the less. And the, then the problem is, how is it even possible? Dr. James Tour of Rice University is the real 
expert on this area where he talks about all these mechanisms and has multiple videos uh, on this. And so I would re refer you to him especially as an expert on this. But the whole idea of the exquisitely complex cell is something that is uh, a marvel indeed to behold. And when you look at all the features and the um, biochemical, uh, bio, uh, biochemist uh, author Michael Denton, as he looks at the various components of the, um, the inner features of the cell, and this, just the cell wall itself is exquisite. And it, 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 it demands an explanation that goes beyond our imagination, just all the components that are involved. And as he himself said, chemical evolution is no more or no less than the great cosmogenic myth. The old, the, the um, Yuri Miller experiment, ex, uh, experiments way back in the 50s, they haven't gone much beyond that. They, they're just not able to, to really have any mechanism that produces uh, any real viable products that would lead to any kind of um, primordial soup concept. The whole notion is that somehow it was irradiated in some uh, context, and the, when you begin to analyze it, it just doesn't stand up. It's, it's just too elegant. In fact, we're looking at uh, cells with artificial languages in their decoding systems. They have memory banks for information storage and retrieval. They have elegant control systems that, re that regulate the automated assembly of parts and components. They're full of error, fail-safe, and proofreading devices that are used, utilized for quality control. And when you look at these simulations that we're trying to develop that try to emulate what they're doing, they, they're mind-boggling, and even those are crude in comparison to what's really going on. Assembly processes involving the principle of prefabrication and modular construction, and at a capacity that's not equaled in any of our most advanced machines, for it would be capable of replicating its entire structure within a matter of just a few hours. And so the idea in the 19th century is that it was basically simple protoplasm, like Legos. And so perhaps, um, although the body is complex, the cells were presumed to be some kind of very simple uh, material. And therefore, maybe just kind of a, kind of a gooey protoplasm of sorts. But now it turns out they're not Lego blocks at all. They're like bodies themselves. There, if you could expand a cell the size of the city of Atlanta, it'd be about as complex with its, all its um, systems for transporting and communicating and moving materials from one part to another and signaling and fabricating. It goes beyond imagination and all the components. And nobody understands really how it works and why it works so absolutely efficiently. And so even Thomas Nagel, this atheist, um, yet he's open to the fact that when you look at the evidence itself, he said, for a long time, I've been skeptical of the claims of traditional evolutional theory to be the whole story about the history of life. He goes on to say it, can, it potentially can be scientific to argue that the data of DNA in life points to an intelligent designer, even if science cannot tell you the identity of the designer or what is going on in the designer's mind. And I appreciate that openness, at least to the possibility, without uh, just preeminently just eliminating the possibility of that note of explanation. So you need to be open to that possibility before you just eliminate it completely. And so in, in assessing this, we look at this material and you look at how it would be possible to get one living cell. And when we look at Darwin's Black Box, a book, a book written by Michael Behe a number of years ago, and he's written several since then, and the more we see, the more we look into these, these things, Stephen Evans as well, you begin to realize we're looking at things that are so incredibly complex and elegant. And these um, re reconstructions, these computer uh, um, emulations of internal uh, components in the cytoplasm of the cell and all the uh, various organelles and how these 
these, all these systems work for transportation, how one signal gets, it, it comes from another, and then it actually needs to create a protein. And then that signal is, is, goes into the nuclear pore complex and goes into the DNA, and then it opens it up, and so transfer RNA goes into the mat material and then brings it out into the ribosome, and it creates a pro uh, these proteins. It's just like a pro it takes these 20 amino acids and puts them together in the exactly right sequence. It's unbelievable, but it has to open up the, these uh, these DNA uh, sequences. How does it know what part of the 3.2 billion nucleotide pairs to open up and then to replicate them and then close them back up and bring them out and transport them here and then make this little machine there and then it has to have, go to another component to fold them and then having folded them, it then takes it and makes a cell transport system and it makes this uh, complex elaborate system that actually goes and brings it to the part of the cell that it wants and then it breaks it down. And on and on, I'm only giving you a fraction of that. It just is astonishing. And the DNA, by the way, only codes for the building of proteins, but it doesn't really account for how you actually have the systems themselves, the actual body plans. It can create the proteins, but it's like taking um, and having a warehouse full of parts. So if you have a 747, it can take all the parts and put the parts in the various places, but what's the thing that assembles the, the parts into the whole? That requires epigenetic information. We don't even know what that is. You see, we don't know we, hardly anything about these things. We don't know how it is in embryology that these, these things suddenly, there's 200 different kinds of possible cell types, and suddenly this now becomes a neuron, or this becomes a muscle cell, and then it goes into its proper place, and it functions, and it creates a part of a system, and so it, it actually achieves a three-dimensional topo topology, and it works. It goes beyond belief, and so the more you learn about it, the more astonished and staggered you become. So we are living in a great time, because the last, oh, 50 years, we have learned more about these things on all levels, each aspect of science, from the microcosm to the biosphere or midicosm to the macrocosm. We're learning far more than ever before. And everything points to elegance, complexity, richness, beauty, wonder, boggles the imagination. And as it does that, the, the theory of basically neo-Darwinianism with its mutations and natural selection becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. And there's a desperate need then for a better explanatory system. But instead of bowing the knee to the living God, whom they know, even though they knew him, they did not acknowledge him, Romans 1. Because his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. But they did not acknowledge him. My conviction is that there's going to be a paradigm shift because the system is totally broken, totally faulted. But instead of bowing the knee to God, they're going to probably come up with some kind of a pantheistic notion where consciousness will be attributed to the substrate of, the, of, 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 the par of particles themselves. Crazy stuff because they won't bow the knee to God. So it'll become some kind of a, a more of a kind of a, as C.S. Lewis predicted, materialist magicians. You see, they'll be materialists. They'll try to make be materialists, but some, have some second story. They're gonna jump to the second story and, and go into cloud cuckoo land and imagine that somehow all this thing came out of nowhere. So it amazes me how these things occur. If you just take one example alone, you can't even for, form a, a protein. Forget about DNA and RNA and the, the, the cell wall and the nuclear pore complex and all the other components that are involved, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, within the cytoplasm and the ribosomes and all these things. You can't begin to imagine it. But just take a protein. If you had a small protein, maybe with 400 uh, amino acids, of, um, and, and you, you're looking at these uh, and they, they, they bond together, What's fascinating about them, they have to be in a specific sequence. And e even there, with these, with these uh, forms, these, the, the nature of these bondings, it gets more and more difficult to actually have them work together in, this, in the bonding sequence. But what makes it even more difficult, not only do they have to be bonded together, and they become more and more 
difficult to have longer and longer bonds, but they also have to be right and left hand bonds. So what's ha what is interesting is that you have both, both types that occur, occur about equally in nature itself. And yet all the amino acids in all the cells of your body are all left handed, even though they occur about equally in nature. Now that's a very strange thought. In all plants and in all animals, all the DNA and all the, all the uh, proteins are all left-handed. Why? No one knows. How did that happen? So if you just take a small protein of only 400 amino acids, you're look, it's like taking a fair coin and, and getting 400 tails in a row. It gets rather suspicious. How does that happen? Then to make matters worse, you also have the difficulty of how nobody knows how, you ha how they fold. Because they fold in such a way that you have a primary structure, and then it has then that folds a second into a second ter, a secondary structure, then there's a tertiary structure, and then there's a quaternary structure, and a, on each level of the protein folding, you get new three-dimensional topographic information that's far more complex, and nobody understands where that comes from or how they can fold it. We we can't fold them. We don't know how, understand how to do that. It goes beyond our technology, our imagination. It's a, an astonishment to me that these things are actually happening. And so I, mar I wonder and I marvel at these kinds of things. When I go, for example, to this book, and I've shown this, this before, uh, it's a book that's called Pheromone. Uh, I love this book because it's, uh, it's kind of like a creative approach where this author, um, insect artwork, of Christopher Marley, very strange. He takes insects and he puts them and he, it's like gardens them as a creative um, curation. So he takes God's work and does these kinds of things, puts them together in interesting patterns. And what do you, what do you notice here? If you were to saw, see this, what would you immediately observe? What would, you, what would you note about that? What would you conclude about this? Would you say, that could have just happened by chance? No. What do you, what do you observe immediately? You observe, well, this, this is blue, and this one's, this, you know, this seems to be a pretty obvious pattern here, and they're all in a square. So you immediately conclude what? Some intelligent design. You'd conclude someone put it there, wouldn't you? Pretty an obvious deduction. What's fascinating, though, while we'd conclude that, we would suppose that each of these were just somehow came into being by chance random mutation and chance. Yet these are infinitely more complex than the pattern that he, he created here. Do you see my point here? So what we, we, we buy into a mythology that has been passed on and perpetrated in academia um, for decades and decades until it's, been, it's, it's become basically a mythology that's been embraced in a, a kind of a, 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 um, an ideology that is necessary to be a part of the academic guild. So it becomes a very dangerous thing for you to go against it because try to publish a paper and do this and you, you become ostracized from the guild. And you look at these things and any one of these things is boundlessly far more beautiful and far more elegant and far more creative than any of the, of the works that we could create. So yes, Marley put these in a nice, frap, a nice order, didn't he? But these are, but the butterflies themselves are boundlessly more elegant and complex than the organization itself. So I, I admire his artwork, but I my, far more admire the, the thing that he's actually curating, if you get my concept. So what we're looking at then is the evident design. And so when we're looking at this complexity and the more we learn, the more rich and wonderful it becomes, the more we begin to realize that it's impossible. And so more and more people have plumped for what they call directed panspermia. What do you think that means? What, is it, what do you think that means, panspermia? Sperm has been seeded. Seeding from where? Somewhere out of outer space. It came from outer space, which is this dreadful movie that I saw when I was a kid in the 50s, it came from outer space, some uh, science fiction movie. So why do they say that? Because it couldn't have or it had its origin here, so it must have come from outer space. What's the problem with that? Where'd that come from? It's not really hard to figure this out. 
You know, it doesn't take much logic to realize all you're doing is pushing the problem back one further to some supposed alien, you see. It doesn't work. You don't solve your problem by just pushing it back one further. And then I did this thing with rock cairns. And again, if you just look at the rock cairns, in fact, as I, I've showed you uh, once before, I, I find that to be fascinating because uh, when I do that, um, uh, when, I, when I look at these things and when people create these crazy things, have you seen these wonderful things? And uh, every so if you were to go out and see one of these things and people make them, and as Pontus Janssen makes these wonderful creations and sculptures that he has an ability to balance them. And he, just, he has a whole website where he fills, he just shows them how he actually, videos of how he balances these things. And they won't last long, but they, he creates these unstable structures that are carefully balanced. And you go out and see that, and what would you immediately see when you saw that? You'd know that was not something that was just randomly there and that was uh, made by just chance. And yet this is trivial in comparison with the simplest organic structures. But we would attribute this to an intelligent design immediately but we'd attribute the other to chance. And, and so we begin to realize there's a very real problem with the evidence itself. And so this is why I'm suggesting then these three lines of evidence, the evidence for the universe is beginning, number one. The secondly, the evidence for the uh, fine tuning of the cosmos that shows that it's, it would appear that the fine tuning parameters are so rich and so elegant that it would require a universe this big, this, this old, this, of this nature to have the possibility of having this one discussion. It's, it's that incredible. But then third, the problem of having even one living cell. We're not even talking about evolution because you have to have a thing living before you can evolve. And even there, that doesn't work for a lot of other reasons, but I don't have to even go there. But then the fourth feature of the world that we can talk about is, infor is information theory. And information theory, by the way, did you see that? Um, go, uh, go, back, uh, go back a minute, because uh, I wanted you to see this. We'll go back to information. When you look at a cauliflower, for example, that's a fractal system. If it, it, it's built upon fractal designs and, and ge fractal geometries. Nature is filled with mathematics and fractal patterns and complexities and Fibonacci series and the, per, and the golden ratio and all these marvels that are boggle the imagination. And there are indeed beautiful natural patterns in nature. So it abounds with natural, like snowflakes. I just love, I have whole collections. I, I, you know I'm a cognitive hoarder. So I have collections a massive numbers of collections no one will ever see uh, of things. And I have multiple things of, of snowflakes because I love them so much and crystals and so forth. But there's nature is full of these. And so crystals and also even sand dunes, there's a whole study of them because they're so elegant and they are, are complex uh, systems and hurricanes or the, of that nature and tornadoes and stalagmites and stalactites and so forth. But there are also these fractal systems. And I remember when I first uh, read about that, this book called Chaos by James Gleish and um, learned about the Mandelbrot and the Julia sets and how they're related to chaos theory. And these are mathematical descriptions of elegant patterns that go on forever. But what I realized was that people were making this mistake of supposing, ah, you see, that's where complexity comes from. You just have these basic simple equations, but it leads to these complex geometries that are scalable down, infinitely down. So you could go down and down forever and ever. So that's where it comes from. No, actually, that's not the case at all, because pattern is not the same as design. It turns out, you see, that these patterns don't have Im much information at all because a pattern is not the same as a design. So unlike a fractal, when you're dealing with music or with your, if you're dealing with a map or if you're dealing with some kind of, uh, of, of written instructions or, or literature, now you have something very different than just a complex pattern. What you now are dealing with is something that is like a human language. It is, um, or computer language, or even more elegant, and the most elegant of all, is DNA. Um, 
DNA turns out to be a language in a complex system that's so rich in information. And the language needs to have a symbolic representation of a physical thing. So music would be a symbolic representation of the movement of sound waves. And a map of Italy is a code in so far as it has information, but it would be uh, correspond to something real. You're dealing with specified complexity and more than just a pattern. And so your DNA is particularly along this line. We're living very exciting times because again, as I said, the evidence is moving us more and more toward elegance and more toward sublime organization. And we can finally conclude that the growing evidence will compare, as I said, will compel a paradigm shift. Your DNA is the most exquisitely engineered communication protocol in existence. And no one can account for how that developed. There's no incremental way that DNA developed. It just didn't suddenly start. Uh, they're trying desperately to find ways. They come, come with this RNA world because they gave up on the protein approach, but that's just as bad. So it, it, it becomes so elegant and wonderful. I'll give you an example of this. It, DNA is a language, you see. It encodes the information necessary for life including the double helix structure. It has an alphabet, you see, and these, uh, these letters are the alphabet. And it has these uh, four letters that it, that it uses, the, uh, the, um, these A, C, G, and T. And so what you're looking at, they link together in these four 3.2 billion nucleotide pairs and form genes, and these genes move on to sentences. So you have um, these, these movements then for uh, the letters of A, uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, and they correspond to letters, and that corresponds to uh, these three-letter codons, and those codons then um, uh, move from, from there, and they have instructions for making the uh, proteins themselves, you see. So that becomes like a word. And every three of those then corresponds, like as it were, to a word. And then that becomes like a sentence, and the, like the gene, and then the chromosomes are like a chapter. And so the, then the, the whole genome is the book. So it really is a whole language. It it's, it's really is, does correspond to information. But here's your problem. Where does it come from? Where does information come from? One single cell can carry more and does carry more information than all the volumes of, let's say, the Encyclopedia Britannica. And we haven't even mentioned an entirely different form of information that transcends the genome itself, uh, that, um, that epigenetic information. So DNA maps direct protein synthesis, but doesn't direct how proteins are assembled, as I said before, into cell types or into tissues or into organs or body plans. That's epigenetic information, and that's found in the three-dimensional structure or spatial architecture of embryonic cells. So where does information come from? So you have to ask yourself, uh, what creates an intelligible message effectively? It, if it symbolically represents something other than itself, it requires a speaker, and, which is a transmitter, and it has, it has to have a listener, which is a receiver, and it contains the elegant elements of the language. So, for example, information, it has to have an alphabet. If you're going to be conveying a message, it has to have an alphabet. It has to have a syntax. It has to have a meaning, and it must have intent. So if I have a statement, for example, he didn't steal that car. Well, we're dealing there with something then that has, um, it has an alphabet, it has a syntax, it has meaning, but there's intent. But if I say he didn't steal that car, there's two ways of saying it, two, several ways. I could say he didn't steal that car, or I could say he didn't steal that car. Now, those are two different intentions, aren't they? Same, so it has the same um, alphabet, it has the same syntax, it has meaning, but the intention is different. The higher can account for the lower, but the lower could never account for the higher. It's always this way. And so it requires a mind to determine which one is it. So it's a very different statement to say, he didn't steal that car, someone else did. Or he didn't steal that car, he stole another car. You see the concept there? And so we get it. 
but you would not be, not be able to get that nuance otherwise. Or another example would be a red light. So if you think about this again, or green light rather, what would that mean? Well, what, what, what are the possibilities? You've got a green light. It could mean a couple of things. It could mean that you have a go ahead for a project, couldn't it? Or it could mean that you literally have a green light. Oh, it just made me think about Rod Serling. Remember this Twilight Zone? If you're old enough to remember the Twilight Zone, he said, he says, consider this, this, this scenario. You are stuck at a green light. Uh, you're an atheist, stuck at a green light behind uh, someone who has a bumper sticker that says, honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> now you have a dilemma. <laughs> I'll let you process that. <laughs> So the lower cannot account for the higher, you see. The higher can account for the lower, but the lower cannot account for the higher. I use this image. Suppose, for example, you had a New Testament and um, um, it, it dropped out and you, you're flying over um, um, the bush in, let's say, in, in, a, in, a, in a very, uh, let's say, in Botswana or somewhere. And, uh, it drops and there's um, a bushman who sees this thing and sees it dropping from the air. Remind, reminds me of The Gods Must Be Crazy. If any of you saw that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, a Coke bottle falls out there and they're convinced that it must be a gift from the gods. And they figure the gods must be crazy because this gift that they thought came from heaven starts to really mess them all up because they were totally content before, but now everybody wants this Coke bottle. They don't know what it's made of, but it's very useful but they only got one. So they, he, the guy who found it is, give, is given the awful task of throwing it off at the end of the, to bring it to the end of the world and throwing it off the end of the world, which he achieves, which is a strange thought. But the idea of, imagine instead of a bottle, it's a New Testament. And suppose these people never saw a written book. What would they conclude? What would, what, how would you imagine? What would that look like? Well, they would have to imagine then that it would be something that would, uh, just be, it'd be, you don't even know what paper is. You wouldn't know what ink is, you see. But it was for, on one level, it would just be marks of paper. But then the next level up would be what? You'd have to explain, explain these are symbols. And then you could explain that these mean, these are words. And then the next level up, it has an intention and a language. And these are thoughts. And then it points to actual truth and ideas. And so the higher, the spiritual can account for the lower, but the lower can never account for the higher. And so it is. Norbert uh, Weiner, information is information, neither matter nor energy. Any mechanism that fails to take account of this will not survive one day. So he's saying information transcends matter and energy. It's extremely important for you to hear this. This is a very recent insight. Because you see, I'm having this conversation with you now. It's being recorded. And we could take this recording and use it in multiple ways. Um, I could send it to you as an email attachment. You could print the thing out. And it could be conveyed. You could read it in a physical form. So we, the information could be found in a physical material. Or you could do it auditory. So it could be, it, the information could be through uh, matter or conveyed through energy. Consider, for example, a DVD. A DVD that has a film versus a DVD that's blank. Would it weigh differently? Would there be any more weight with a film that has, it has a film than one that doesn't? No. But yet one has a movie and one doesn't. You see, the information transcends the matter and the energy. It's actually more ultimate than matter and energy. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He transcends matter and energy. He who spoke matter and energy into being. It's a fascinating concept. So I'm saying then that information, or what we would call this, the logos, transcends all of that. And so we're beginning to learn this. And so the atheist riddle is, show me a message that doesn't come from a mind, a coherent message, because it requires a mind. The upper it require, can account for the lower. The lower can never account for the higher. Uh, there's a site called randommutation.com. It's fun because you enter a text like the, um, the, the quick brown fox uh, jumped over the lazy dog. And you enter it in and watch the fun when it, when it mutates. And all it does is get worse and worse because mutations never make it better. 
It's, it would be like taking a rifle and shooting it at your CPU and your computer and hoping it gets better, make your computer run faster. I don't think that's going to work very well. So what we're looking at here is, is the fact that when we're looking at your, your whole uh, life then, and you're, you're the, 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 in, the, in the lower cannot account for the higher, your body consists um, not only of your cells and of your tissues and your organs, but also systems you see, and all these things synergistically fit together in ways, again, where the lower cannot account for the higher. And I've talked about this area, about information. Um, I was talking with uh, groups of atheists, and it's interesting, they acknowledge the problem, and one of them, I, I still remember, they use promissory materialism. Here's what it is. They say, well, um, actually, maybe eventually we'll find answers to this. You see? Now who's living by faith? Because you see, the first two laws of thermodynamics uh, show that the universe cannot be eternal, but they're willing to come up with exotic um, mathematical theories that have no empirical warrant and hold them, hold on to them, multiverse theory and so forth, in spite of the fact that they violate the most fundamental laws of physics, who's living by faith now? where there's no empirical evidence. So actually, remember I told you about Pascal when he said effectively that God has apportioned the evidence in such a way that there's enough evidence to satisfy the mind of a person who chooses the way of belief, of trust in God. But there's also enough ambiguity to allow a person who rejects that to, to actually rationalize his disbelief. Why? Because he doesn't want to force you, you see, so you get to choose. He doesn't impose or force because he's, he, this, he's the sacred romancer and he woos, but he will not impose. Now, here's the interesting thing. What happens when skepticism and cynicism increase? Guess what happens? God bumps up the ante of the evidence. So as cynicism increases, because you see, in previous generations, theism was the default modality. Now it's materialism, not theism. Things have changed. And so when skepticism increases, guess what God has done? He's bumped up the evidence. And what, to, what has he used? Of all things, science and technology. That's amazing. So I think we live in a great time. It's, for me, it's very exciting. Then we can conclude just there are some other features of the world that would also have to be taken into account. Human consciousness, rationality, moral values and obligations, the nature of beauty, human dignity, value and purpose, and human rights. Which accounts for this better, materialism or a theistic view, a top-down view? And you, the answer is painfully obvious. Um, those, these make sense. When, there is a, when you're dealing with a context in which there is an ultimate way, foundation for, for goodness and for truth and for beauty, for relationships and so forth. But when you're dealing with a worldview that's nihilistic, that has no basis or warrant for anything that we could call good or true or beautiful, those then have an emptiness and an ugliness and there's no basis for really any form of human rights or human dignity. Um, universal re religious experience. So the inescapable conclusions of Darwinism then are that there would be no God, and all the implications of that. There's no life after death. That this the tale, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Yet your life is merely an episode between two oblivions. Enjoy the ride. And uh, it's it's like again, Woody Allen. You see, I. You want to live on uh, in the hearts of your friends? No, I want to live on my, in my apartment. Um, because he, and he was right, you see. Because what happens, even then, even if you lived on in the hearts of your friends, what happens when they die? And they will, you see. Then you're a cipher, a nobody. So let's think it through. There'd be no absolute foundation for right and wrong. You may claim and be morally uh, exercised about this cause or that, but you don't have any warrant whatsoever when you deny any absolutes for good and evil. And so they're, they're, borrowing, they're living on the borrowed capital of a worldview they've, they've rejected. And finally, as well, there's no ultimate meaning for life, and there's, no, there's also no free will. They're just slaves of their selfish genes. And so a higher view is, tells us that design points to a designer. 
And that's where we go from there. As, as Merton once put it, we're not at peace with one another because we're not at peace with ourselves. And we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. It is God who then solves that dilemma of giving us peace with God that then empowers us to have peace not only with him, but with, with ourselves. And because we have that, we can then have peace with others. And that gives us a true sense of the implications of what our life is called to be. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We ask you that you would go, drive us and, and draw us into your truth. Your word is truth. And your word is the living word, Jesus. And we worship and honor and praise him. Um, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen.